Well, first of all, um, my name is Devin Eckhoff. I'm the, um, the executive director of the CTI and uh, uh, division director of transplant. It's my great honor and privilege to be here. I'm actually really humbled um, by being the one that gets to speak to you about this. And it's a really uh, very special day. It's a celebration. And um, we have, a, as you can tell, we're celebrating. We have a lot of dignitaries and special guests here. And I also tell you, you can tell it's a celebration because I'm wearing a suit. Well, <laughs> those of you that know me, normally I'm up here in scrubs, so this is a special day. And not only is it a suit, but it's a special suit. It's the second time I've worn it. The first time was when I walked my oldest daughter down the aisle. So. And I think today, it's kind of like that day that we started these programs, Dr. Deedham, the kidney program, and I know I'm going to leave people out, just like the father of the bride speech, but... You know, Dr. Kirkland, Borge, Gaston, Curtis, all these people started these uh, amazing programs at UAB. And right now we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the kidney transplant that happened, but we have outstanding lung, heart, liver, pancreas, um, small bowel, and we're looking back, celebrating uh, the past, but we're also looking to the future, celebrating the future, because there's a lot of amazing things that are going on here at UAB. And I feel humbled, you know, standing on the, you know, the shoulders of what uh, Dr. Didom did. And, and the analogy again to being the father of the bride, uh, for these people that started these programs, they started with a hope, believing it was the right thing to do, to do these transplants. And back then it was a lot of hard work and you kind of nurtured it. There was uh, a lot of success, but there was also failures. And it took amazing perseverance by these giants to keep this field going. And, marching forward and continuing to do the transplants. So uh, I'm uh, really uh, pleased and honored that uh, Dr. Deedum's been here. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and celebrating with us. And I know I'll leave people out, but you know, this is, transplant's really a team sport and we can't do it uh, to be an excellent team. And we know what good teams in the South are about. You get people that are the quarterbacks and, and the wide receivers that get to be the stars and stand in front of you, the surgeons and physicians. But the team is only as good as all the players that do their part, from the guy that makes that block or uh, makes that pass. Or, um, so I'd really like to acknowledge, you know, from the administrators, the, uh, transplant assistants, nurses, pharmacists, coordinators, nurse practitioners, all the nurses in the ICU, the floor, um, the OR. Uh, this is really um, in recognition of all the work you've done because we get to stand up here People say job well done, but really it's it's job well done to the team. And I really like to acknowledge the team that's been built here at UAB and that's carried this forward. And I also like to acknowledge that we're celebrating this day couldn't happen without those who are really generous in donating, both living donors for kidneys and other organs, and also the deceased donors. You know, we have this amazing team that wants to transplant people and restore people's health and do this gift, uh, this miracle gift. But um, that can't happen unless people donate. So there's an amazing group of people that uh, became living donors, or if it's a deceased donor in a time of grief or sadness when their loved one died, um, being able to give that gift of life and to allow other people to live. So I really think um, our special hats off and our acknowledgement to those people. Um, so uh, um, UEB's tradition, we also want to celebrate the patience that we've had because uh, Dr. Deedham, I think the second year I was here, you gave the Distinguished Lecture speech, and the title was The Patient, right? So his talk at that time was, whenever you don't know what to do, think about what's right for the patient. And as long as you think about what's right for the patient, you will do the right thing. And I've kept that close to my heart the last 20 years, and try to always remember what's right. And if we do the right thing by the patient, um, well, we'll be, come out okay. Um, like this, um, not only the patients, uh, the program, but um, we have some special guests that will like to say a few words, and then we'll wrap it up at the end with a, I'll will with a few more comments. But uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ray Watts, the president of the university that came and is also um, here to celebrate this day with us. What a special day of celebration. It's so wonderful to see patients, families, medical staff, employees across the board, community supporters. We have one of the greatest transplant centers in the world. And 
and we have saved thousands and thousands of lives. Dr. Dedell, thank you for beginning this program as a pioneer in 68, and we couldn't be more proud of our comprehensive transplant institute staff and physicians and surgeons. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Watts, for those words. Uh, our next uh, a guest speaker is uh, D Dr. Will Fernani. It's the CEO of the Health System, and he'll make a few comments. Happy 50th birthday to the UAB Transplant Program. Everybody wish him a happy birthday. Happy birthday. This, uh, this is a birthday that has allowed over 14,458 loved ones have many more birthdays. Without this program, those birthdays would not have happened. A birthday for a program that everyone at UAB is proud of and everyone in Alabama should be proud of. A birthday for one of UAB Medicine's signature service lines. A birthday for, I wrote some of and then cross it out, a birthday for the best transplant surgeons and staff in America. A birthday for a program whoa, that has seen advances such as performing Alabama's first adult to adult split liver transplant in 2015, a procedure that is only performed 15 times a year in the whole United States, a program that has launched a xenotransplantation program with a grant from United Therapeutics. Human transplants may be possible by 2021, a program has, that has performed a record kidney change and a program that I hope never sees its 100th birthday. I hope we never reach a 100th birthday because advances of research at UAB Medicine and other academic medical centers will have made the need for transplantation obsolete. But until that time, thank God for our 50-year-old transplant program and many more birthdays. Thank you. Well, our next speaker, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, the Dean, Dr. Solomon Vickers. Um, we both began here, what, 1994? Um, I am transplanted in uh, Dr. Vickers in hepatobiliary surgery. And it's been a long journey and it's been, a, uh, it's really been a great friendship and he's a, a, not only a friend of mine, but a friend of the transplant program. And he's been very encouraging and trying to make things happen to um, eventually, hopefully, we can fix this organ shortage problem with the xenotransplant and get all the people on our list transplanted. So like Will and Ray have said, happy birthday to our transplant program. And this is a special anniversary for UAB. I think that as Devin mentioned, this wouldn't occur without great leaders and great teams. 50 years ago, Gil Deedham came to Birmingham, Alabama from Boston. Gil worked in Joe Murray's lab, who won the Nobel Prize for doing the first transplant on two twins. He brought that talent to UAB and to Alabama. And that's still our legacy and story today. We want the best and the brightest to be here to give that to the citizens of our state, to the Southeast and the world. And there's no better program that's demonstrated that than UAB. When I talked to Gil about this program, he knew this was something he wanted to do, and there were several things in his mind. One, he wanted to do it right, and secondly, he wanted to do it for everybody. Gil made a commitment that he wanted the best outcomes, and secondly, no matter who you were, what background, what color, what creed, and if you needed care, you were going to get it at UAB and under his leadership. And he carried that out. As you heard mentioned, over 14,000 transplants, and probably a program with the most diverse heritage of those transplant recipients of any program in the world. You heard Devin talked about a comprehensive institute that Will and Ray put together to really combine the concept not only of the clinical care, but of the science and the next generation of work to be done. This history, this 50-year history, marks the beginning of new things that we're doing as well, and this expertise will continually allow people to come from around the country to get this done. And to that legacy, people came from almost all over the world, from 44 states and from multiple countries. And although we celebrate the kidney at the first organ, as you know, we didn't stop there. 
We've done the heart, we've done lung, we've done pancreas, we've done liver and small bowel. These are what make this institute comprehensive. You also heard Devin mention there's really no more powerful a story than being an individual who can transform someone's life. And Gil's right, the patient means a great deal, but in this world, the donor also means a great deal. It's a world where being a living donor, you can actually change someone's life. Even a loved one, even someone you don't know, you can make a difference by donating an organ. And that's a part of the legacy of our transplant program. Striving to make sure everybody understood in the community what we were trying to do and that it couldn't be successful if it wasn't fully embraced by the entire community. Those who unfortunately were deceased, who made the commitment before they died that they were going to donate their organs, and those who were alive, who chose to give to someone they cared about, all of that is the work that has helped transform the culture of giving and health care in Alabama that really rests at the feet of this transplant program. So to that end, Gil, thank you for starting the program here and for that small thing you did of hiring me 19 years ago. I appreciate that. And for Kirby keeping me on. Uh, and for Ray giving me a chance to come back. But this program is one that we remarkably admire and as Will said, that we expect will continually do great things and hopefully put ourselves out of business. But until that time, we're really proud of the work that's been done and what will be done in the future. And if you haven't seen it, Google UAB transplant. You'll see some of the stories. You'll see the videos of our leaders today and what they've done to transform lives here in Alabama and the world and beyond. Thank you all, and happy birthday. I think a common theme this morning is uh, about the gift that the donors did. And we've acknowledged the living donors. Um, I looked over, and I know I forgot someone, but I saw Chris Meeks and the Alabama Organ Center, and they are really a big key to our success, because without the tireless work by all the coordinators and staff there that uh, take those calls in the middle of the night, um, that make those gifts of life happen. Um, we wouldn't have a transplant program. Um, my next guest that is speaking is Dr. Is, uh, Thomas Smith. He's the executive director of the Birmingham VA. So some of you may be a little puzzled. Why are we having someone from the VA speak? But um, I don't know how common knowledge it is, but that first transplant wasn't done in the North Pavilion or even Jefferson Tower. It was done over at the VA. So actually the uh, transplant program with UAB physicians started at the VA. I hope to hear from Dr. Dedum why it started at the VA. I'm sure he has a story about that. But anyway, we'd like to welcome Thomas Smith to give a few uh, comments. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy birthday again. I feel like we should all sing happy birthday, but we will uh, we'll abstain for now, maybe later. Uh, thank you, Dr. Eckhoff. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to also thank Martha Trammell for including us in this celebration. Uh, but I also want to thank Dr. Watts, uh, Dr. Vickers, Ms. Perniani, for including us in there, in this program, and for the wonderful partnership which we still enjoy uh, and very much value. I was going to give that, that history lesson. There's a lot of history in this room, but uh, the history for us began, as, uh, as Dr. Eckhoff said, in May of 1968. In fact, on this day, when the first transplant in Alabama was done at the Birmingham VA <coughs> with UAB doctors. Dr. Deedhelm. And that is so special for us because it, 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 we continue that partnership today uh, that began 50 years ago. That American hero that received that first transplant in the state of Alabama was Hollis Milton Lucas. He received the first transplant and UAB itself has done a few transplants since then as you've heard this morning. But I'm happy and proud to say the uh, Birmingham VA Medical Center has also started and restarted our transplant program, our renal transplant program, two years ago. And although we're nowhere near the number that uh, UAB enjoys, we are in double digits now, and we're very proud of it. And we continue that. And again, it is in partnership with UAB. You know, that is so important because the VA realized years ago that we cannot continue to provide the best care any, anywhere for our nation's heroes, our veterans, without our community partners, folks like UAB and the other partners in, in the community. So as a recognition of that, I am incredibly, incredibly excited to be here today. I want to take a moment to recognize some very special people that are here today. 
First of all, it is an honor to have Milton Lucas's spouse, his wife, Jane Lucas, here today. And beside her is Milton's brother, Harold Lucas, who was the first living donor for Milton. And I know there's some other family members. Would you please raise your hand wherever you are, over here. Thank you all for being here. What a legacy. And I would be remiss if I did not recognize our own Birmingham VA transplant team. There's a couple of folks here, Sharita Williams and Felisa Lee. Where are you? Raise your hand. You're in the back. There they are in the back. <clears throat> and along with Kim Rowley, who's on military leave right now, they do a wonderful job of taking care of our veterans over there. So once again, thank you all again for including us in this uh, celebration. I look forward to the continued growth of this program and our partnership with UAB. Happy birthday, everyone. Thank you. At this point, I, the introduction's already been done for Jane and Harold Lucas. I, I don't know if you want to say a few words to the, um, no? <laughs> well, we want to thank and acknowledge you. We have a special gift for you, um, for your role that you've played in this who would have thought 50 years ago where this place would be? How many 14,000 lives have been affected and saved? So we have a gift um, shirt. Well, um, last but not least, never last or least, Dr. Diehelm. Um, I've learned a lot from Dr. Deedham um, about leadership and making a program grow and getting up when you've been knocked down and keeping going. And one of the key things I learned have always been really uh, uh, is that, again, it's a team sport. And the relationship that he developed with the nephrologist and uh, infectious disease. And so the surgeons, we get to go in there for like, you know, do the case. In about two weeks, we feel really good. But it's the nephrologist or the medical colleagues that take care of them before the transplant, then take care of them for the rest of their lives afterwards. And they have an integral part um, of that. And we have some uh, outstanding colleagues, Gaston, Curtis, Julian, that were really not just leaders at UAB, but leaders in the world uh, for their work in transplant nephrology. But um, Dr. Deedham started the program. He's the one that had the uh, vision um, for not only doing kidney, but all the organs. But uh, one other thing that I don't think people appreciate is the vision he had of the role of the donor. So in the early days, um, donors, you got calls. He didn't really have a, a set organization to take care of it. So he formed the Alabama Organ Center to create an a, a organization that would encourage and promote donation and do it in a very professional way. And if you wanted to develop a big program, and get people transplanted. And why is having a big program important? Well, in the southeast, we're the hotbed of kidney disease. We have the highest incidence of kidney disease. So if you really want to help a lot of lives and affect a lot of people, you needed to find a way to get them transplanted. And he had the unique uh, foresight to start one of the first organ centers, and it's grown from there. Um, so anyway, without further ado, Dr. Dito. Well, I appreciate all the people that have come today. I'm particularly pleased to meet, after many years, the Lucas family. <laughs> and <laughs> there are a few comments I'll make going back 50 years. First of all, uh, we needed to start the transplant program. And uh, I'd been here six months or so, and people were waiting, but I hadn't done anything. So Mr. Lucas arrived at the VA with chronic renal failure and needed a transplant. And his brother, 
came immediately and the family never blinked an eye. Uh, Dr. Kirkland asked me, what are you going to say to the first family when they ask how many transplants have you done? <laughs> I said, I've never done one. He said, that's what you need to tell them. <laughs> Um, just a few comments on, that people don't know much about. First of all, there is no financial support outside the VA for transplantation in 1968. The Medicare program for transplants did not join the end-stage renal disease program until 1973 three, if I'm right on that. And so we started to do transplants both at the VA and the University Hospital. And the financial structure of the University Hospital in 1969, 70, 71 was fragile at best. And after we performed eight or 10 transplants, I could see that there'd be a big bill at the University Hospital for patients that couldn't finance their care. So I went to Dr. Kirkland one day and I told him, I said, we're gonna get a big bill from the hospital and I don't even wanna think about it, but we better plan for it now. And he says, I'll call you tomorrow. That's the way Dr. Kirkland was. <laughs> there were never any committees and the committee was the last thing he ever wanted to hear about. So the next day he called me, he said, I talked with Dr. Volker. Dr. Volker was the president of the UAB. And he said, uh, there's a line of credit for you at the University Hospital of $250,000 to take care of patients that have no insurance. I thought, wow, that's terrific. And he said, when that's used up, we'll talk again. Well, that didn't really impact the Hollis family because he was a veteran, but it had a great impact on others. One was a little boy from near Carbon Hill, and his father drove a coal truck. They had five children. They'd come in and see Billy, as the boy's name was Billy, eight years old, and they'd come in on Sunday after church. And uh, I could tell that times were tough. So Billy had a transplant, everything went well. And it was late, it was after Thanksgiving. I'd see Billy in the afternoon, he was a little blonde haired boy, eight years old, and would love to come to me and make rounds with the patients. He'd hold my hand, we'd walk around. <laughs> And I said to Billy, I said, Billy, what do you want for Christmas? He says, I want a Daisy air rifle. I said, no kidding, yep. And I'm gonna get it. I talked to Santa Claus and he says it's coming. Well, I knew that the family didn't have the wherewithal to do all that. So make a long story short, Billy is discharged from the hospital, goes home and I had a, person that worked in the dialysis unit, Jim Harden, who is from Carbon Hill. And uh, I asked him if he could, with a technician in the laboratory, if they'd go buy a Daisy air rifle, we gave him some money, and if there's anything left over, get some clothes. Well, Jim Harden went to his church, and they got lots of food and teddy bears and everything. And I said to Jim Harden, I said, did you find the house? He said, you know, I've lived in Carbon Hill all my life, and I never knew the road or where they lived. And it was about three miles off the highway, and it was an old workman's shack. Um, no sign of Christmas. This was about four days ahead of time. And you could, he said, I could tell that things were not good in the Beauchelle family. So we went to the house, knocked on the door, and about five children came out, and he opened the trunk, and they tore into those packages. Christmas was out in the 
in the yard next to where the trunk of the car was. So I thought to myself, you know, the real Christmas gift was the Volcker Kirkland line of credit. That family never knew about it. <laughs> and they, uh, they, they never were told, you don't need to tell people good things. They know it. The fa house had no floor, dirt floor, and then outdoor plumbing. But that family never complained, and they were great. And Billy was a wonderful patient. He uh, kind of patient you'd look forward to seeing in clinic every time he came. The purpose of bringing that up is that it goes back, this is not known by many people, but it goes back to the 1950s when Dr. Kirkland was at the Mayo Clinic and he did the first open heart operation in a child, six years old, who came from Bismarck, North Dakota. North Dakota is a long way from Birmingham and Bismarck is in the center and it is a farm town and how the family got to Rochester, I don't know, but they did. And they interviewed 25 years later the little girl that had that first open heart operation. And the question was very simple. What do you remember about your first trip to the Mayo Clinic? And she was quoted, it was a very big place, lots of doctors, and everyone was so nice. One doctor had a crew cut. Another doctor was very handsome. And one doctor picked me up and made me feel special. <laughs> you know, John Kirkland had that had that ability to make every patient feel special. And he could do it. And he'd do it in many different ways. When he made rounds in the hospital, he was always with a starched white coat. He'd sit on the patient's bed and look at them directly. Everything was highly organized. And his patients came from everywhere. I never asked Dr. Kirkland who paid for the little girl from Bismarck, North Dakota. My guess is some plan arranged by the Mayo Clinic, similar to what I call the Volcker Kirkland plan here. But it was the Volcker Kirkland plan that lasted until 1973. Then the program, transplant program, was absorbed by the government with the end-stage renal disease program. One final comment. A transplant or any operation requires a large number of people, many of whom you never know about. Who picks a patient up and brings them over to the operating room on the stretcher? Who sterilized the instruments for that operation at three in the morning? Who really washed down and scrubbed the operating room? Who were the nurses that came in early to do the operation? Surgery requires a large number of people, many of whom you never hear about. And those may be the most important. At any rate, I thank all of you for coming. Uh, I'm pleased to be here in lots of ways. Uh, and I think that uh, the transplant program symbolizes the attitude of the medical center, the administration, 
And it all goes back to the Kirkland Volcker plan of 1973 when I thought we'd run on the money. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Needham, for those words and those stories. I always enjoy them. Uh, Martha Tankersley, who's the, actually the trans fund administrator, is acting as Vanna White today. So if you want to give uh, Dr. Needham his gift, this is from the uh, trans fund wow. institute for you, acknowledging this day. So anyway. Well, we're wrapping up the program, and I, I think we talked about the celebration of the past 50 years, but um, we're not satisfied with what's happened the past 50 years. We really look forward to the next 10, 20 years um, for great things to happen at UEB. we got great leadership here in all organs, and um, we're looking to make transplant, even now it's a, a regular thing, but our biggest focus has always been getting enough organs um, for the recipients because the demand is so great. And that's been through innovative programs like paired kidney exchange, desensitization, where Dr. Vickers alluded to, we're putting a lot of money and resources into looking at xenotransplants. So eventually we can just schedule every operation and tell people when they have to show up and they will have appropriate organ that'll get them off dialysis or uh, fix their renal failure, or their heart failure, get them off the of vats. But I really like to thank everybody that, that's uh, taken part of your day to come here and celebrate with us. I'm not sure if there's cookies left and punch, but it was back over here. But thank you for coming, and uh, thank you, Dr. Dedum, and all the people that led the way for us to follow. <laughs>